This is Ed Rep Radio, presented by Eastman Music Company. You're probably wondering where the background music is. Well, the topic today is going to be something that is not specifically about the music industry, but it can hugely affect your success as an ed rep. I'm talking about the topic of developing your skills as a sales professional. This is something that I'm very passionate about, and I'll share a rather personal story as an example. 20 years ago, right after finishing my music education degree, my first job and my first introduction to the music industry was at a respected music magazine as the advertising sales manager. My job in a nutshell was to call on the entire school music industry and sell advertising space in the magazine. I was super excited about this new job. I had youthful enthusiasm, I had ambition, and I had no idea what I was doing. I was a music major. I was trained to teach band and orchestra students. I had no training on how to be a professional salesperson. I enjoyed talking with people around the whole industry on the phone and building relationships, but when it came down to it, I had no real sales skills and I had no clue where to start. I had no idea how to ask the right questions, to uncover customers' needs, overcome objections, or gain commitments. In fact, during my tenure, I lost the largest account at the magazine. That led to my losing that job, and it was very, very humbling. It was also a huge learning experience, and it made me realize that being a great salesperson was a learned skill. It was something that could be trained and practiced and improved. A lot like learning an instrument, really. After starting as an ed rep in a new sales role at Summer Hayes Music in 2004, I was determined to figure out how to be a great salesperson. I started reading lots of books on sales and learning as much as I could about how to be an effective sales professional. In the summer of 2018, I went looking for a new sales book, and I found an interesting book on Amazon called Action Selling. When I got the book in the mail, I started reading it, and I could not put it down. I've read a lot of sales books, but this one was different. It was real, it was practical, and it was incredibly applicable to my life as a salesperson. I liked it so much that Eastman hired the Action Selling Company to send out one of their professional sales trainers to work with our entire sales team. It was a fantastic experience for all of us, and I can't say enough about the effectiveness of the training and of their sales system. We're very fortunate today to have as our guest, CJ Collins, Vice President of Sales Training at Action Selling. CJ is going to go over the framework of their selling system and how to apply it to your life as a sales professional. Because when you boil it down, that's what a great ed rep is. CJ, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, no problem. I'm excited to be here. So this is a different topic for, for the ed rep radio audience and one that is really uh, kind of near and dear to my heart. And as you'll, you heard in the, the intro, uh, it's something that I learned the hard way that, that selling is actually a learned skill and something so important to anybody selling anything, really. So I'm really looking forward to this, this conversation. And before we launch in, I'd like to get to know a little bit about you, CJ, uh, how you got to be where you are at Action Selling. Oh, sure. Well, I ha- it's been a long and winding road, <laughs> so I'll try not to bore you with too many details, but I have been in sales or sales leadership or sales training, uh, some mix of those three things for the last 25 years or so. And you know, actually, I should probably recalculate that because I know I've been saying 25 years for at least a few years yeah. now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so who knows what the actual number is. But, but I actually started in sales when I was 16 years old. Huh. I started in a retail store selling eyeglasses Okay, right at an eyeglass store. And then actually spent a long time in the eyeglass industry. So I- anything you want to know about eyeglasses or eyeballs or contact lenses, <laughs> I, I can probably tell you. But so I spent a long time in that industry industry started there in sales and it just was have always been in sales and then I, I developed a love of sales just because I, sales by its very nature is just constantly connecting with people mm. which I love mm-hmm. and then also developed a love for training which also by the way is about connecting with people. I, it's a common theme in my life. I'm like extroverts, extrovert, I guess. <laughs> so I love training and I love sales. And now I don't have to choose. I get to be involved in both, which is fantastic. So all through, I've been in sales on and off in both person to person, you know, B2C sales, and then also 
uh, business to business sales for the last 25 odd mm. years. And then selling everything from selling to, you know, doctors, selling to realtors, selling to uh, individuals, selling tech, uh, you know, doing sales or sales training for technology stuff. And so kind of a wide array of mm. things. And then I was, you know, wanting to continue in training and, but I didn't want to be, uh, no offense to anyone, but I didn't want to be like an HR trainer. Hmm, so, okay. cause I love training and connecting, but I just, the whole like compliance, check the box training, I just not a fan. I, you know, it's not something I felt thought would be fulfilling. So I stumbled across this opportunity at action selling to teach sales, but not just to an internal team to like a different team every hmm. week. You know, which I just thought was a just I, it's an opportunity I couldn't miss. So applied, uh, got the role. I've been in this role now for a year and a half. Okay. So and it's been fantastic. So that's where that's where I am now. I love I just love the fact that every every week or two I get to learn about the ins and outs of a new company and a new business model. There's so many different like business models and opportunities and things that you're like you just think to yourself. Wait, you sell you sell what? And how, who who is your customer? I had no idea that was even a thing. And everyone's situation is unique, so I have to take and learn their situations, and then apply the principles of action selling to what they do, which is just a lot of fun. Okay, so yeah, that would be really interesting to to see lots of different industries, lots of different sales reps uh, doing all sorts of different products and things like that, but applying mm -hmm. the same principles across all of these different industries. Do you find that that sales principles like action selling applies across multiple industries pretty well? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, otherwise this would be a <laughs> much more difficult job for sure. But yeah, the, the great thing about action selling specifically is that the, you know, sort of the framework that we, what we teach is a framework. I should just start there. We teach a framework for how sales conversations should be conducted. And the great thing about that, a framework is that you get to fill in the in-between, okay. right? You get to fill in the space in between the framework. It's, we provide a, a roadmap, but the words you say and the questions you ask, those are going to be entirely dependent on you and your customer and your industry. But we provide the roadmap to make call sales conversations much, much more successful. So, and the great thing is, it's almost like, you know, when you're a little kid and they give you, you know, it's like, hey, here's a, here's a coloring book. Okay, great. Well, the coloring book has just the outline of what the picture should look like in the end. It, you know, and in sales, the outline of here's what the goal is that we're trying to achieve. Hmm. But you get to pick the colors, right? You color it in. The outline is there to provide some constraint to make sure it doesn't go off the rails. But you provide the color in between. And so, uh, so yeah, it does. It applies. I, I have never seen an industry thus far. And I've, I have helped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of salespeople at this point and I have not seen an industry where it doesn't apply. Huh. So, okay. That's a good Okay. Answer. Good to know. I, I want to give you a little bit of context of the audience we're talking to, just so we can apply maybe some of these principles to, to what they're doing. And just so you know who we're talking to, uh, the... The sales rep that we're talking to is the what we call the ed rep, and they're they're outside sales staff for music stores in the school music industry, and they uh -huh. they're constantly driving around visiting band and orchestra teachers with the goal of having those band and orchestra teachers use their company or suggest their company to parents and students. Uh, for for their beginning rental instruments and uh, buying their next instrument and buying instruments for the schools and using their repair shops and things like that, but they're they're essentially outside sales staff for music stores, and they have long term relationships with a lot of their customers. Um, and they also have, sometimes have uh, you know, I guess quick sales turnaround. But maybe they'll work with a parent mm -hmm. and they'll have one hour with them, and they they go from meeting the parent to selling them an instrument. What we're about to talk about and what I just described, uh, do you think action selling and its framework works well with with that kind of situation? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting, too, because I was, my very first job in high school was working at a music store what? for next, like two blocks from my house. I worked at a music store, uh, called, a shout out to Meyer music in Blue Springs, Missouri. No kidding. Um, yeah. And so I don't know, I don't know if Betty Meyer is, you know, would listen to the podcast, but uh, she was the owner. We know, we know, um, we know anyways, Meyer music well. 
Oh, do you, you really? Do. Oh, yeah. hey. I, so I kind of, anyways, I worked there. I was, I was, but I was the kid who like stood at the counter and like, you want a clarinet read? Okay, great. Uh, what's a clarinet read? So I had to learn the, all the various reads and, you know, ligatures and all, I had to learn some equipment. So I had to check people in for their lessons and sell them. But it was clear at 16 that this was just like a tiny piece of their business. Mm. They spent a ton of time selling all of the, I think all of the studio pianos and pianos in in the high school that I attended and all the middle schools I, were from Meyer Music. And so huh. anyway, uh, I had a fantastic experience. Yeah. I did um, not know that about you, CJ. This, is, this interview was meant to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was a music minor in college because I wasn't smart enough to be a music major. What, yeah, what, so. What were you, uh, were you an uh, instrumentalist? Were you a singer? Oh, no, I'm not that smart. I was a vocalist, oh, right? Okay, so okay. no no offense to vocalists, but I mean, I didn't have to practice nearly as much as those piano majors and, and you know, woodwind majors. So yeah, I was a vocalist. Okay. So. Well, <laughs> that's hilarious. You know our audience well then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's awesome. Uh, so let's let's dig into who is Action Selling as a, as a company? Where are you based? And what are the, what are the kind of offerings do you do? Well, Action Selling is based in Plymouth, Minnesota. So we are on the sort of the western side, uh, western suburb of the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities area. And we have been, we actually been around for over 30 years. So mm-hmm. we've been doing this teaching and doing sales training for for 30 some odd years. And the great thing is it, it, action selling's always been a bit different because we were sort of pioneers in the idea of of benchmarking and collecting data around the students that we that we teach. Hmm. And we started doing that years and years and years ago. I mean back when like you had to fill it out on a you know like a scantron, you know. And then we had to like hand grade these and send the mail the results oh, back wow. back in the day. So uh, we've been we've been benchmarking and measuring and collecting data uh, for over 30 years on on uh, on our students. It, it primarily because that helps us to identify at, at broad strokes the issues that m- that most salespeople generally face and the mistakes that they typically make, not to offend anyone, but you know, sometimes we make mm. mistakes. And then adjusting and making tailoring our content over the course of 30 years to address the most widely made mistakes and uh, the biggest issues that will make the the biggest difference for our students and for our customers, our clients. Hmm. Because if you think about it, you know, any sales training, there's lots of things you could teach. We could teach any number of different skills, but what we've learned, you know, if we, based on the data that we've collected, there really are, we focus in on five sort of foundational skills. We call these, call these five critical selling skills. And so that's kind of our primary focus is, is focusing on five critical selling skills and then teaching the skills necessary to see improvement in those because they have the greatest impact on performance. Mm. And then aligning your sales conversations to be in sync with the way buyers make decisions. If we know they kind of make decisions a certain way, if we can have our conversation follow that path and we're in alignment with them, and then we're just going to have a lot more success. So that's kind of like what we do, and it's uh, fantastically successful uh, everywhere it's tried. So that's the good news. Okay. But like I say, our, we've got a long, long history. We've been, you know, I, I don't know, I guess we could brag a little bit, but we're on the top 20 list for sales training companies every year. Wow. And pretty much every year that list has existed from Training Industry, which is a, a, tra- a industry magazine, industry publication, Selling Power, another industry publication. They put out top 20 lists of sales training companies every single year. Mm. We've been on those lists ever since they've existed. Great. So, so that's kind of, a, yeah, that's a bit of who we yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm curious about the topic of sales training itself. And I, I bring this up because when I first started in sales many years ago, I didn't even think about selling as a skill. I didn't think about, I, I thought mm-hmm. you were just born with it. I thought, you, yeah, that, that guy's <laughs> obviously a salesperson. I mean, just listen to him talk in the way that he works with people. But I... I didn't know it was a skill and I, I had no skills when I first started. Uh, and so now, obviously now being in, in, in selling for so long, it, it's obvious something that you can, you can get better at. So what do you see when, after you've worked with the, the sales um, reps that you've, you've been working with in this training, what do you see after they're, they've gone through the training and what do you see is different in how they approach selling and, and their success in general? Oh man, there there are really several different places where we see some big changes. But the the overall, when I look at it, the overall theme of what I think happens is that 
when you teach a framework like we do, uh, sort of a roadmap, and it's not a script and it's not a, you know, a bag of tricks, you know, in this situation, you can do this thing. And in this situation, use these sort of magic words, Mm -hmm. you know, to win. We don't teach that. Instead, what we teach is a, is a framework, a roadmap, and then you, you fill it in with your industry knowledge and, and adjust it to your customer. But what we find is that the big overarching thing is that we ask you to apply some intentionality to the way that you approach sales conversations. And what's really interesting and sad is that most salespeople don't, you know, and again, I don't want to insult anybody. I'm sure that your listeners are probably the the exception to this rule, but most salespeople walk into a conversation with no plan Hmm. and then they end the conversation with no, no next step planned for either. You know, we, we quote the statistic very frequently, 62% of 62% of sales conversations end with no commitment or agreement being asked for at the Hmm. end. And which is, is it kind of nuts when you think about it, because what do we like? Why do we exist? Like, what do we what is our job as salespeople? Our whole job is to get an agreement or a commitment from the customer. And I think that for many folks, they just lack an intentionality about asking for a commitment in every conversation uh, because they think that the only commitment I'm going to ask for is for the sale. I'm going to ask for the sale. Mm. And yeah, sure, eventually you will. But some of these, some of these sales, especially in business to business sales, of course, it, they, they take a long time. You're gonna have several conversations before you ask for the sale. So in the intervening conversations, what are you supposed to ask for? And the answer is ask for whatever's supposed to happen next. You know, mm-hmm. if you know that, hey, this is my initial conversation, we're doing, you know, qualification and sales word for I'm just gonna find out if what you need is something I actually do. So that's what I do here. But like, but what's the next conversation supposed to be? Am I supposed to, is the next conversation conversation supposed to be a, a needs analysis conversation where I just kind of uncover what you're trying to accomplish and what you need, what your concerns are, what your problems are? If that's supposed to be the next conversation, then in that qualification initial conversation, that should be what you set as your objective for the call. And you shouldn't leave the call without asking for that conversation. Ask to schedule that next conversation while I have it. Anyways, I, clearly I could go on and on. But I guess what I would say is the big deal is intentionality. Intentionality around what commitments you're going to ask for in every conversation. Intentionality around taking time at the beginning of every conversation to build the relationship. Not just jump into business, not just jump into my sales pitch, but be intentional about building the relationship in every conversation. Be intentional around what questions you ask to uncover needs, uh, especially needs that set you up for success. Anyways, Hmm. I clearly I could go on and on. But I guess when people walk away from action selling, what they walk away with is a plan for being intentional about their approach and intentional about organizing the conversation so that it aligns with what the way a buyer is inclined to be already thinking. Hmm. Does that make Absolutely. sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is a great segue into the actual action selling process. And uh, I first want to say, when I when I read the book, the action selling book, I, somehow I stumbled across this like on Amazon. I was just looking for, for a sales book and I saw action selling. Well, that sounds interesting. And I have to tell you, when I when I read this book, it was like a lightning bolt just like hit me when when I was reading through the book and the process itself. And that fact alone of having a plan, asking for even just a small commitment to the next step, it was just like mind blowing to me. Mm-hmm. And in it, it really sets the tone for conversations you have with your customers and and having a plan in general. So I would love to start going through. The, the action selling process, if you don't mind. And I'd like to just kind of hand it over to you to, to go through the steps and I'll, I'll, I'll try not to interrupt is what I've got to say. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you don't speak up and then you'll get a CJ filibuster <laughs> kind of uh, filibuster. famous for those. <laughs> we, we say that one of the critical selling mistakes that people make, that salespeople generally make is what there's, we, we've outlined five kind of big okay. ones. And one, <laughs> one of them is they, they talk too much and listen too little. Mm. And I'm like, oh gosh, I feel really guilty. Every time I teach this in a workshop, I'm like, I just have to raise my hand and say, okay, this is my problem. You're going to notice this over the 
the two days you spend with me, <laughs> I talk too much. So I, I try, I'll try not to do that. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to walk through through the sort of steps of action selling. And I'll just say too, just kind of referencing back to what you mentioned about the book, is that for for a fairly inexpensive book, uh, I forget what it retails for on Amazon. You know, it's like twenty, 20 bucks, bucks or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a short read. You could read the, the whole thing in like probably ninety minutes. Mm-hmm. But I I remember reading that and just thinking, oh man, I I that I'm in this book. I <laughs> I feel like I'm a character in this book. Every single one of these mistakes, I have I have made these mistakes, and then it just made things so clear. So it's a fantastic introduction to the action selling process. I would encourage just anybody. I mean, surprise, surprise. I work at action selling. I would, I would highly recommend you spend 20 bucks on yourself and read the book because there's just so much in it. That's really helpful. Absolutely. And I I Um, want to say, CJ, uh, I'm going to put a link to, uh, to this book on the program notes of this episode. So, uh, anybody listening, you can just simply go to the, the program notes, click on that link and buy it right there. I highly recommend you do it. Sorry. Oh, that's excellent. Go ahead. Excellent. So all of that to say, so, uh, you know, shameless plug aside, uh, let me, I can talk to you a bit about the action selling process. So there are nine steps in our action selling process. We call this the nine acts of the sale, but really in order to understand why they are the way they are and why they're in the order that they're in, you have to understand that they're, they're there to provide a roadmap so that you can, as I, as I've mentioned, they're, they're there to provide a roadmap so that you can align what you say and guide the conversation with your customer so that it is in line with the way they're already predisposed to make decisions and predisposed to be thinking. So the logic behind the nine acts of the sale are based on what we call the five critical selling. Well, I should say, actually, we call these the five buying decisions. We have lots of fives. Hmm. So the five buying decisions, the five buying decisions are this, and, and here's what you need to know. A, when customers make really large choices, they make five decisions. They don't just decide, do I want it or not? Uh, hmm. You know, do I like the price? Hmm. They're actually deciding on five things. Okay. Number one, they're deciding, do I like this person that I'm talking to? Ah. Is this salesperson somebody I want to continue to work with? Do I trust them? Do I trust their recommendation? Do they seem like they know what they're talking about? Are they competent? So they're evaluating us as as salespeople. And so, and the thing is, what we don't realize is they do this in every conversation. Right. And it's easier to convince them. And once you've known them a long time that, yes, you can trust me because you've built up, you've built up social capital and trust over the course of conversations, but it can be lost. Right. So that's why we have to be intentional about selling ourselves first. So the first is the decision is, do I trust the salesperson? Second decision is once they say, yes, hey, I, I really I think this person is somebody I want to deal with. The second decision that they make is on your company. Is your company, is your store, it, it, is it a company that's a good match for, for me, and ma- a good match for my company? Uh, is it going to be a good match? And we say the best course of the best way to, to get them to, to say yes to that question is by letting them know how some aspect of your company solves one or more of their problems or concerns. Mm. Uh, but once they said yes to the salesperson and said, yeah, actually, this company, too, is a great match for me, then the third, que- the third question, the third decision they make is your, your solution, the thing that you are selling. Does it, does it fill my needs? Does it solve my problem? Does it make my life easier, right? So once they've said yes to salesperson and yes to company and then yes to solution, then the fourth and fifth buying decisions are the price, price and time to buy. So for price, they're looking, the evaluation is, is the value I'm receiving worth the cost that I'm paying? And the dirty secret, actually not so secret, is that the value gets built in those first three buying decisions. Hmm. That's why we have to do these in the right order. You want to you know, follow these buying decisions because it's in those first three decisions that you build value. And then, so then when you quote the price, they can evaluate that price against the value that you created in the prior in the prior bit of the conversation. So, hmm. and then once they say, yeah, actually this is a good price, then the next question is time to buy. And that's just Okay, when, when do I want this? When does it need to be delivered? When do I need to make a decision? The great thing about those five buying decisions is great or scary is that that first decision is the most important because if they don't make it past us, the salesperson, then they they don't get to hear about the rest mm. or the rest of it doesn't come across as as valuable. So the good news, though, is that guess which decision we have the most control over? It's ourselves. You know, right. I, I don't own the company. I don't get, to, I didn't create the solution. I don't set the price. And they're the ones who decide when it's time to buy. 
the, the one decision I have the most control over also happens to be the most important decision. So all of that to say, that's the logic of the nine acts of the sale is that we want to, we want the, the, every single customer sales conversation to follow those five buying decisions, salesperson, then company, then solution, then price and time to buy. So the nine acts of the sale go like this. Uh, act number one, set a commitment objective. Now, this is something you do before you even start the conversation. If you know you're about to have a sales call or a sales conversation, before you engage with the customer, you think ahead and say, okay, what am I, what am I doing in this conversation? But more importantly, at the end of this conversation, what am I going to ask this person to commit to? And there are some factors to keep in mind, of course, as to what you might ask them to agree to. A, uh, what role do they play in the organization? If they're not a decision maker, if they're a decision influencer, then we have to be careful that we ask them for a commitment that's reasonable. I don't want to ask somebody for a commitment they just can't say yes to. Mm. So I have to take into account who I'm speaking with and what they can reasonably say yes to. And then the next thing to keep in mind is like, well, then what should be next? I want to ask them for something they can say yes to that moves us forward. Hmm. And it can be a so small that, thing, that's, right? It doesn't have to be the the big ask for the sale. It can be a, kind of a small step. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because in, especially in more complex sales, and the bigger the deal is, likely the more complicated it is, right? Hmm. So in in more complex sales, there's several conversations that have to take place before a final yes is given. And so I, in any given conversation, many times, if not most of the time, the agreement you're going to want is to get them to agree to whatever the next conversation is supposed to be. Mm. If this is my first visit and you know, I've only, I know you've only got 10 minutes to talk and I'm just going to introduce myself and kind of get an understanding that what you need is something I can do, qualify you, then I, I'm going to get you, I want you to agree to another conversation that's longer, maybe an hour where I can actually sit down and discuss and, and do what essentially is a needs analysis analysis or, or a discovery call to get to understand your needs. Okay, great. Well, then what do I do after at the end of that? Well, I, the next conversation maybe is maybe I need a demo. Maybe I need to show you the product or show you the solution uh, and what it can do. So then at the end of that needs analysis conversation, that's what I want you to agree to. I want you to agree to the demo or agree to the solution presentation. So all of that to say, commitment objective, we are intentional about deciding ahead of time, what am I going to get this person that I'm speaking to, to agree to that moves the process forward? Hmm. If you think about it, hmm. what would happen? <laughs> what would happen if every conversation ended with the customer agreeing to the next step. I mean, what, just think what that would mean for your sales cycle. And for most, well, our clients find that we have, we have a significant reduction in sales cycle. It varies from company to company, but anywhere from like, you know, 10 to 20 to 30 to 40% reduction in sales cycle, depending on the industry. But, but also think about it from your customer's perspective. And I'm going to try not to overteach this chain, but think about it from your customer's perspective, right? If every time, you know, okay, gosh, if every time I talk to Shane, things get done. Hmm. It feels like every time I talk to Shane, like things happen and we move forward. Hmm. Then what does that mean to them? You know, it generally, it means they're going to feel like their time hasn't been wasted, right, right? which guess what? They don't have a lot of, they don't have a lot of time. So they're going to feel like their time hasn't been wasted. And the great thing about that is that then just think if, if in your customer's mind, they think, gosh, you know, every time I talk to this particular rep, uh, we get things done, the ball moves forward, then what are the chances that the next time you call, what are the chances they're willing to take your call? Hmm. Good point. You know? So anyways, I love commitment objective. It made a huge difference for me when I learned the concept. And then I remember thinking, why, why did nobody tell me this 20 something years ago? Because wow, this would have made a big difference. Right. So step one, act one is a set of commitment objectives. So be intentional about what you're going to get them to agree to. Act two is where we begin the actual conversation with the client. So we sit there with our customer and we are, and act two is essentially where we're really intentional about building the relationship and connecting with them. And what we find is that actually the more you let them talk and the less you talk, the more they like you. So how can we be intentional mm. about asking really fantastic questions to connect with them personally 
and get to know them on a one-to-one basis, but also get to know get to know their company. So, you know, if you're dealing with a particular, I think of your reps, if they're dealing with schools, if they're dealing uh, with other institutions that are needing to buy, you know, how can you understand their situation? What are, you know, and get to know the school itself. Now, I should say, Act Two is is a sort of build the relationship act. So we're not doing needs analysis yet, but they just need to know that you know them. They need to feel known, mm, right? Yeah. And then it, the other interesting thing about Act Two is the, the reason this is important. And we don't just skip past this and like let's just get down to business. Is that it's important because we know that if you try to ask for if you're going to ask for commitment in every conversation, some kind of commitment, even small commitments that the the bigger the commitment you're going to ask for, the bigger the relationship needs to be. If you try to ask for a commitment that is larger than the relationship that you've developed, you're going to you're likely going to get resistance to that uh-huh. commitment. So what that means is that every conversation if you think of your sales cycle, every conversation, the next conversation is going to be a bigger commitment and the conversation after that is kind of a bigger commitment. So we need to grow the relationship in every conversation to ensure that the size of the relationship is always bigger than the size of the commitment that I'm going to ask for. So how do we do that? We've, you know, intentional strategies around asking questions and good open-ended questions, de- demonstrating that you're a great listener. We've some some good some thoughts on how to be intentional about doing that. But so once you've done so act 2 is to sort of get to know you introduce and just sort of get to know them, build the relationship. Act 3, we transition from asking questions about them and getting to know them, we transition, continue asking questions, but in act three, the questions are related to their needs, their problems, their frustrations, what what they're hoping to get accomplished, their goals. It's a needs analysis portion. Hmm. And so act three is where we understand their needs, because guess what? When we get to, eventually we're going to make our recommendation. If they don't feel like we have a good understanding of their needs, how can they really trust our recommendation? Hmm. You know? Yeah, right. And so, and here's the thing, I I know that as salespeople, you know, many times you're walking into your 1000th school visit and the thing that this particular, you know, this particular individual is facing is the same thing that the other people have all, you know, you may get, you may have this sort of sense that like, okay, I already know what they need. I've seen this before. I've done my homework. I know what they need. So I can just tell them what they need and then tell them how to fix it. And you may be able to do that, but it's not a good idea because the val- there is value from your, on your customer side. There's value from them on saying their needs to you and seeing that you hear them and understand them. People like to talk more than they like to listen. Hmm. Uh, salespeople are not alone in that. And so give them an opportunity to do what they like doing, which is talking about what they're facing. Because if they do that, you can demonstrate that you've listened, that you've understood, that you remembered. And because you've demonstrated that, now they can put a lot more trust in what will eventually be your recommendation. So anyway. I want to jump in there a second. I, I just remembered uh, another book from your companies that I had read uh, called Questions, the Answers to Sales. Uh, what mm-hmm. a great book and what a great time to kind of throw that in there that you have a whole, you have a whole book dedicated on just this topic alone of asking those right oh, questions. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I Now, I didn't have to make the shameless plug. I, you did it for me. That's great. No, it is a fantastic book. And, and here's the thing. The difference, and we go at, we spend a long time and speak at length about this in our training, and that is that when it's time to ask questions about their needs, there's two routes you can go. There's the the path most commonly traveled, and then there's the road less traveled, right? So what most salespeople do is they ask, they kind of ask what we would call the wrong questions. They ask like not great questions. Hmm. They ask what we would say are sort of commodity questions. And commodity questions are questions that result in needs that everybody can fix, right? If you look at who your competitors are, you know, you ask, you're uncovering needs that everybody can fix. Well, how does that help? Mm. How does that make you stand out? How does that make you different? And so instead we want to focus on how can you, how can you create questions that uncover needs for your competitive advantages? How can you uncover questions, uh, ask questions rather, to uncover needs for the things that you do that no one else does or the things that you do in a way that is obviously better than your competitors. Because if they can say, gosh, that's what I need, 
and I'm the only one who does it, or we do it in a way that's obviously better. Mm. When they say, then, gosh, the thing that I need is the thing that only you do. Well, then when it's time for them to decide between you and your competitor, who else could they possibly choose? Mm. So questions are, I mean, they're just so crucial to making sure that your actual sales presentation is successful. So, so how do we do that? I mean, we teach a strategy. Uh, we it's a, we teach a strategy called backtracking benefits, which is essentially saying, "Hey, figure out what you're good at. Figure out what your differentiators are, and then back your way into questions." Uh, we get a lot more detail in, in the workshop, sure, but yeah. back your way into questions that uncover a need for that thing. So we have this whole process that we teach about how to do that. But if I can ask questions, and you say, "Gosh, I need X, Y, Z." And guess what? My my store, my company are the only ones who do X, Y, Z, or we do it and everyone else is like really not good at it. And it's well known that we have a reputation for the, being the best at that thing. Then then that makes us the obvious choice. Hmm. So we spend a, a long time uh, in, in our workshops talking and working through. This is sort of the beauty of the workshop too, is that, I, hey, we show up, We here's the framework. Now here's the thing. Let's talk about your customer we're, here's some here's some framework for questions. Let's teach you some strategies around questions. Okay, now why don't you write some of those, work together in a group, and then come back and let's uh, let's hear them and get feedback on them. Hmm. So we spend a lot of time wood chopping questions and providing feedback to make them ever more insightful. And one final word too on questions is that. I think a lot of times salespeople feel like, oh gosh, I can't really do an in-depth like needs analysis because my my customers just not, I mean, they don't have time for that. They don't, they're not patient. They don't have the patience for me to just sit, sit there and pepper them with questions. Huh. And okay, fair, fair. But I would respond with two things. And that is A, they probably haven't, uh, don't have time for it because you, you haven't maybe asked them to make time for that. You haven't set the stage that, that that's what you're going to do. Like, hey, in our next conversation, I'm going to spend a lot of time just sort of asking questions to make sure I truly, fully understand what's happening in your world. Because when I propose my solution, I want to make sure it's tailored to exactly what you need. So uh, is that fair? So if I you let them know ahead of time that that's the plan, they come to that conversation prepared to answer questions. Hmm. So that, that's my first thought. Hmm. Yeah. The other thing is that every time you ask a really fantastic, insightful question that, that makes them think, then A, it builds your credibility. And remember, we're, we're selling ourselves here. Like this is part of the part of the conversation we're selling ourselves as a salesperson. When you ask really insightful questions, every fantastic, insightful question you ask earns you the right to ask the next insightful question. Hmm. If you're asking super basic sort of check the box questions, then yeah, I mean, who doesn't get bored with those? But if you ask really great questions that makes them think, what that does is then sparks the conversation. And the great questions get them talking. And the interesting thing is, the more they talk, the more they're willing to let you ask the next question to let them talk some more. So huh. anyway, so far... So I, I realize I probably should pick it up here. Sorry to take up so much time here, but oh, no, this is great. Um, no, take all the time you need. <laughs> I, I tend to. Here's the thing: every time I talk about these things, I get excited, and then I overteach it. That's my problem. <laughs> okay, so, so, okay, so we set a commitment objective before we talk to the customer. We we uh, start the conversation intentionally building the relationship. Act three: we spend some time uncovering their needs, frustrations, and problems. Act four is when we reflect back to them the needs that we heard and get them to agree to them. So, hey, I, so you're looking for something that, or you need an instrument, or you need a program or a process to help you do this, save this, help with this, this, and this. Is that correct? And when they say yes, then they have now given us permission to sell them on how we solve every one of those needs. So this is, this is where we sort of open the actual sale. We have now we have their permission to address each one of those and how we fix it. Hmm. The great the, the thing about agreeing on need, this is act four, is that this is also an opportunity to sort of make sure that we didn't like miss something, right? They can, they can, you know, if we say, hey, is that correct? What did I miss? They can also say, well, there was this one other thing that we didn't really talk about, but I wanted to see, you know, hmm. see what you could do. They can bring it up, right? And then, and then I circle back to act three and say, okay, well, let, let me explore that. Act three, ask some questions, make sure I fully understand, and then come back to act four, say, okay, so these things plus that thing. But once they agree on the need, we have permission to talk about how we fix those things. That's fantastic. So acts two and three and four are where we sell the salesperson. We are demonstrating 
our insightfulness, we're demonstrating how, how, how great of a listener we are and how much we understand their business and are here to help them, that we're on the same team. And we focus in heavily, by the way, I should, I should say, in Acts 2 and 3, we're focused almost entirely on open-ended questions, which everyone knows what those are. Everyone knows they're a good idea. And yet, when I listen to salespeople, as I do every day, <laughs> We don't really actually practice it very much. We don't actually we don't actually use it in practice very much, but it's so powerful because open-ended questions means they do most of the talking. It's not just a yes so, or no question, right? Right. Open-ended questions are questions that can't be answered with yes or no. So questions that start with who, what, where, when, how, you know, how, how is this, how did this problem get to be here? What sort of impact does it have when this, if this were to continue happening, how, how much money is that going to cost you over the long run? Those are all open-ended mm. questions. Or tell me what you think about such and such. Explain how this came to be. Those are sort of imperatives, but they're open-ended, right? As opposed to, you know, did you have this or has this been a problem or do you want, those are all closed. And so your mm. answer is going to be less helpful with closed-ended questions. And, and the other thing is, on balance, in your sales conversation, uh, especially in X2 and 3, they should be doing 90% of the talking. So if every question you ask has four, five, six, seven words, and the answer is yes or no, then the balance is wrong. Mm. So if you ask a four or five you know, word question, and then they speak for two paragraphs, that's the right balance, right? Mm -hmm. So and open-ended questions are what help you to do that. Because part of the, the best way you can build a relationship is demonstrate, one of the best ways, is to demonstrate great listening. But it's hard to listen if, if you don't get them talking. So open-ended questions are how you do that. Okay, great. So once we've got them to agree on need in Act 4, then we move on to Act 5, which is what we call our company story or a company statement. This is, this is where you sell them on that second buying decision, which is the company. You sell them on why your store, your company, is a great match for their institution. So, and this can be as simple as just sort of like making, a, letting them know of some award you've gotten recently or, or letting them know of um, some new development that you've made or a new product line you've added or whatever, or sort of a positive company statement. But the most powerful way to do that is to, to connect some differentiator of your store or your company with how that differentiator or that competitive advantage of the company solves a problem for them, right? You just, you just uncovered what their needs were. They agreed to the needs. If you can say, if you can say, Hey, this need, you said you had this need, here's some aspect of my store or my company that actually completely addresses that need. Hmm. That's the most powerful way to get them to say, yes, actually this company is going to be a great match for me. So we teach a, a sort of a, a framework for, making sure that we are addressing needs with some competitive advantage of our company. That's just, and we spend a lot of time working through that in the workshops, mm. uh, having you kind of create those for yourselves, your company, your store, you have, you have competitive advantages. There's something about you that's different than your competitors. Well, what is that? And it's not just because I should say this, when it comes to differentiators, you could have differentiators for you as the salesperson. You could have differentiators for your store, your company. You could have differentiators or competitive advantages around the solution or the product that you're selling. All of those places are fantastic places to get your competitive advantages from. Hmm. And in Act 5, we're leveraging one of the competitive advantages or differentiators about the store, about the company, and saying, here's how this adva advantage addresses one of the needs that you mentioned. And then when you do that, that is the most clear and obvious way to say that we are a good match. And so when they say, okay, yeah, that the comp this is a good match for me in Act 5, then we move to Act 6, and we essentially use that same process of saying, hey, you have this need, here's some aspect or differentiator or competitive advantage of my solution or my product that addresses those needs. And just one by one, addressing each individual need that you uncovered and pointing to the thing about your product that addresses that need and what they get out of it. And we also teach, we also teach that throughout this process, we should be pausing and asking questions too, hmm. to get their feedback. Right. Because the danger here is that, you know, in Acts 2, 3, and 4, we were asking them questions. So they were doing all the talking. We finally get to Act 5 and Act 6. And now now it's our turn to talk. You know, and for most salespeople, this is the exciting part. 
right? This, <laughs> this is the part I'm good at. I know what, I know our stuff. So I would really want to talk about this. And so then they just go on and on and on. They don't connect the needs. They don't connect their, their features or their, their differentiators to any of the needs. They just, they feel like they have to list every possible, hmm. you know, thing that we could possibly do. Hmm. And, and really, if you can't connect something you do to something is a need that they mentioned, it's probably not worth talking about. Because why would they be interested? If it's not a need they have, yeah, why would you yeah. want to talk about it? Good point. It, right? Why go on and on about something that means nothing to them? Yeah, exactly right. So so we just be we are intentional. There's the word again. Intentional about the way we ad- address their needs one at a time with the, uh, the differentiators of our product or our solution. So, and then once you've done that, then the next step, Act 7, is actually ask for the commitment. And then... And not in a, not in a soft, like, uh, you know, if I'm just like really friendly, eventually they'll ask me for the sale. I call it sort of like trying to friend zone yourself, you know, in sales. It's like, maybe if I'm just super friendly enough, eventually they'll just, you know, hand me their money and ask me for the sale. Um, it didn't work for me in middle school <laughs> and it doesn't work in sales. So in Act 7, you actually just ask, you know, you've built the value. You've told them what, uh, what you can do. You've gotten to know their needs. Now's the time to ask for the commitment. And, and as noted... I mean, that commitment could be as small as, you know, how about we have another conversation a week from today to discuss X, Y, Z, or where I can show you about my solution, or we can do a demo or whatever it is. But sometimes it's just getting them to agree to the next conversation, Hmm. you know, and oftentimes, I guess if you're, I mean, sometimes you have more complicated, you know, sales where you're selling to government institutions, so there's an RFP process. And so what you want them to do in those more complicated, you want to, in Act Three, you want to uncover, ask questions to uncover what those processes are. If they're well defined and they and like written in stone, I want to know what those processes are because that's going to inform what I ask for here in Act Seven. Hmm. It's going to inform the commitment objective I set in Act One and what I ask for in Act Seven. If I know that I need to be uh, declared an eligible bidder, like I have to earn eligibility first, then I'm going to ask for that commitment uh, or whatever. So okay. yeah. understand the process by asking questions and then use your commitment objective in act one. And you're asking for commitment in act seven to actually gain commitment for it. Act eight is where we confirm the commitment. That's to help reduce, uh, buyer's remorse or cancellations, you know, mm-hmm. just confirming mm-hmm. it to them takes 15 seconds. And then the final thing act nine is where we look back over the conversation and find places to improve either with someone else or for ourselves. The great thing is now we have a framework to do that. I don't just have to like look back at the conversation. We're like, well, I think it went well, or I don't know, that did not go well. Now I can look at it and say, well, what was my commitment objective? How did act two go? What questions did I ask in act three? Did I get them to agree on the need? What happened in act five? I can, I can examine every conversation through the lens of this framework and zero in on exactly what went wrong or what went well and make adjustments. So from a coaching perspective, as a leader of salespeople, I love having this framework because I can take this framework and apply it to salespeople and just and just for coaching conversations like, hey, let's talk about this. Let's walk through the nine acts. Let's pinpoint the part that maybe needs work and maybe practice it or role play it or uh, make a plan for it. So anyway, that's the great thing about having a process. OK, so that was a lot of me talking. Sorry about <laughs> no, that. Was that. So good. But... That was so great. I, I want to mention that uh, as you've been talking, I, I have my action selling book out in front of me and I have this nice graphic that actually outlines very clearly all of these nine acts that, that CJ was, was talking about. And so it's really easy to visualize it and follow along. I know it's probably a little bit more difficult going on strictly audio, trying to follow everyone, but it is really easy when you get the book. There's the, the chart, you can see it flow. It's really clear and easy to follow. Yeah, having and we find that I mean, tons of our salespeople. I mean, like surprise, action selling has salespeople too. And our salespeople and our clients, they end up just sort of pinning. We have we give everyone like a little, I don't know, half sheet cardboard. It's not cardboard, but I don't know something nice. Yeah. I'm like not describing it well, but they just sort of pin it in their cubicle so that as they're having a conversation, they're sort of following like, okay, where am I supposed to be? Where am I going next? And it just makes having the conversations easy, yeah. uh, you know, because you know where, where you're supposed to go next. Yeah. You know, it's funny on that topic of your salespeople, I, honestly, I can't remember how this came about. I think I maybe bought another book. Maybe it was that ask the right questions book um, on your website, and there's a little form you fill out with your information, and and uh, right. And then somebody called me, and immediately I liked the guy because, and, and obviously now he was following this this format. Mm-hmm. He was following the nine acts, and I look back and I have to kind of laugh and smile because 
it worked because we had actually someone <laughs> come out to Eastman to work with our sales staff and it was fantastic. But yeah, just looking back at your salespeople, they're, they're incredible because they follow this, this, this nine X and it, it's so effective. And speaking of that workshop, yeah. do you mind talking a little bit about what that format looks like? If, if somebody's listening and thinking, man, I really would love to have uh, somebody come out and work with my company. Oh, certainly. So there are a couple of different ways that that we can facilitate workshops for folks. One is uh, we do pri- private workshops where essentially we try to accommodate your schedule and it's 16 hours of content. So it's, mm. it's typically, often it's two full eight hour days. Uh, but sometimes folks want to divide it up and do four, four hour days or, or whatever. But we either come out to a specific location and host it in person, or we do it virtually as well. We actually have won the top 20 award for virtual sales training. Oh. Just just a plug. Okay. Another brag. Great. So, so we do this the workshop, the same, same interaction, same content, same discussion and feedback. All of that happens virtually or in person. And so when it's private, we kind of try to work around your schedule and div- divvy up the days however works best for you. The other thing that we do, and like I say, in person or virtual, the other thing we do is we host a... Uh, at what we call an open workshop. So once a month, we host an open workshop and those are often either virtual or if some folks will come, if they're close by, they'll come to our office in uh, here in, in Plymouth or the Minneapolis area. And so sometimes it's hybrid where some people are virtual and some people are in person and uh, our facilitators are very good at handling those. And the open workshop is where, you know, you'll be in a workshop, but the other people are all from maybe different companies. Hmm. And so we're all learning the framework together and through that framework, you know, we're doing the exercises together and and then hearing feedback from the trainer. And so it's it's a different sort of it's interesting because some, there's real sometimes real value in just sort of cross pollination like, oh, well, OK, you have a completely different industry than me. But that question that you wrote, man, that's a great question. Hmm. I can adapt that question to my customer. And then, yeah, there's something about having an open workshop that's a lot of fun. And what we find is. Even the clients that we have that they, they get us, you know, to come to a private workshop for, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 100, however many students that they have. And then when they onboard new students, one or two or three at a time, rather than a new private workshop, they just say, you know, we'll send our new students as they ha- get hired. We'll just send them to your monthly open workshop. Okay. So that's the other other thing that the way that we do it. So and we have a lot of success uh, with both. I mean, it's just. It's, it's two full days for the open workshop. It's usually the first Tuesday and Wednesday of every month. Uh, every now and then it has to get bumped for holidays or whatever, sure. but that's usually when the open is. So either private workshops or open workshops uh, are the most common. Okay. And I'm going to put a link to your website uh, if anybody's interested to, to start there. Is that what you would recommend? Start at your website and maybe click a, a contact us kind of button. Yeah, actually, so I, probably the best place, just so we know that that you you heard about us on the on the podcast. If you just go to if you go to if you go to actionselling.com slash social, like oh. like social media, because okay. uh, I imagine I'm going to end up sharing this on social media. So if you go to uh, actionselling.com slash social, that landing page um, will be a great place to just you know put your information in there. I promise you, we are not like trying to sell you a car warranty or whatever. <laughs> if you if you fill that out, you probably will get a call from one of our fantastic uh, business development managers, and really they just want to see you know, what gauged your interest. And if there's some way we can help you, then great. If you're not ready for that, that's fine too. You know, let us, you know, we'll call back some other time and whenever you are ready, we're here. So we've been around 30 years. We'll still be around when you're ready. So yeah, that'd be probably the best way. Okay. And I'll put that link. feel free to noodle around on the website. There's lots of great stuff on there. Yeah. Yeah, there is. I'll put that link in the uh, uh, episode notes as well. One final thing I wanted to, to ask about is is after someone's gone read the book or, or or they go through the training and and they have this knowledge now, do you have any tips for someone to make sure that this sticks, that it becomes a habit, that it's just mm-hmm. becomes part of who they are as a sales professional? Oh, absolutely. So, and I would actually say this is when we talk about differentiators and competitive advantages. This is a differentiator for us. We, we were pioneers in the idea of sort of after training reinforcement. So, so I'll just, A, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do to help with that. And then we'll maybe just talk a little bit about some things that you can do uh, on your own. So after every workshop, we, we have a reinforcement period. So I should say this, 
for every single every single workshop that we have, it's a five phase approach. So before the workshop even takes place, we do some benchmarking and testing. We have you read the little storybook. There's an introductory video so that you come prepared at the workshop. You're pre- kind of prepared to learn and have at least a sense of what you're gonna what you're in for. We have the two days of the workshop. That's sort of our train phase. Following the training itself, we go into what we call a reinforcement phase, where basically on a what we recommend is on a weekly basis you'll do these online exercises. So we have our learning management system called Learning Link. You go in there, you have these weekly exercises where it's, it's each exercise takes like one concept from the training that you learned. And it says, okay, let's go through and actively apply this to what you have coming up. Think about your customers, the calls you're about to have. How do you apply this concept to those customers and those calls? And then look back. Hey, remember what you did last week? You said you were going to apply that concept in this way. How did it go? Hmm. What were the results? And so it sort of like sort of forces us to actively apply the concepts on an ongoing basis and reinforces what you learned because it's a lot to take in over the course of, say, two days. So now we just one concept at a time over the course of, you know, a few weeks, uh, applying it to your actual conversations. And I, so that's the reinforcement and that, that's what helps it live on. I mean, so for those, you know, sales leaders who are wanting to create like a sales culture, this is how you do it, right? Is, is that you take concepts where everyone now has the same framework and speaks the same language and they handle customers the same way. So you have this sort of consistency with the way customers are treated and handled that now you can use to coach. Well, that only works if, is after the workshop, if, it continues to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So that reinforcement is key to making it stick around because we're sort of actively, intentionally, purposefully applying each concept directly to our actual pipeline, our actual customers. So that reinforcement is key. Then we, we have, I should say, we have an assessment after that just to gauge if there are still any knowledge gaps. And if there are, we apply additional exercises to, to shore those up. And then we have a final certification uh, that when it's like a college level exam. If you pass that, then you are action selling certified. And the reason we drive people toward that certification is because that is where we get the assurance that they not only know what they should know, but they can also apply what they know in real life scenarios. And it's that knowledge and application that is key to making it live on. And as a side note, I would say we find our research shows that folks who get certified in action selling have an increase in sales that's six times greater than their colleagues who are not certified. Whoa. So you know, like, why wouldn't we want that? Right. <laughs> so <laughs> surprise, that's what we're going to drive toward. But I will say this, you know, the great thing about this framework is that the more you use it, the better you get at it. Mm. Right. Having a plan improves performance. And now action selling is your plan for every conversation. So, and, you know, at first, you know, it takes a little a little adjusting too. but the more you actively apply the, the plan, the better you get at it. Right. And then if you remember Act 9, this is the other way to make it stick is use Act 9. Look back. How did the plan work? Where did the plan go off the rails? What can I make an adjustment for? You think about every major elite athlete things that they do after it's all said and done. And the thing that they do most is they look back and watch game film, hmm. right. you know, and, and why, why is that? And do they wait till like, you know, two, three, four weeks later? No, they watch it almost immediately afterward. They, they look back and say, what happened in this one spot? Okay. Now that happened. Oh, now I know what to focus on. And when they do that, that's how they actively apply change and make it stick. So act nine is a real key way to making it stick. You know, it's funny you mentioned athletes, but as you've been talking, I've been thinking, you know, musicians are the same way. They'll, they'll look back at their performance, they'll practice it, they'll, um, you know, continue to hone their skill day after day after day. It sounds like selling is, is a skill just like that. Yeah. And you know, I actually think that's the good news, right? Because if it's a skill that you can improve with practice and with focus, then it you don't have to be born with it. Just like what you said. You don't have to be born. It's not as though if you're not born with it, it's too bad. You know, Um, you don't have to be born with with great sales skills. Um, Don't get me wrong. It's great to have good raw material. But wherever you are, we can help focus in on the five critical selling skills that we teach and see a significant improvement. So and, and I would also say no matter how good you are, if we focus in on the five critical selling skills, 
we can still see improvement. So um, I think I actually think that's good news. I have taught many, 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 many salespeople who would say, I'm not actually a salesperson. I'm an engineer. Mm-hmm. Or I'm not actually a salesperson. I'm a subject matter expert in this thing, X, Y, Z. Well, but now I'm in a sales role. Well, the good news is sales is actually just conversation. It's just it's just connecting with customers. So if I can give you a structure, kind of a roadmap to have those conversations so that they end successfully, how would that, you know, how great would that be? You know, mm-hmm. and um, and that's really all we're doing. So that applies so well to to the people that are listening right now. I mean, everybody, myself included, no one went to college saying, I'm going to be a sales professional. I'm going to major in selling. Every single person listening is either a former teacher, music teacher, or a former performer, or musician, or maybe they got a music education degree and went, you know, somewhere, somewhere else in, in, into the business side of it. Nobody listening uh, is was a sales um you know, masters of sales from so and so university. <laughs> right. Most, you know, I actually only know of. There may be more, but I only know of two universities that even offer a degree in sales. So, because um, huh. two more than are. I thought. <laughs> yeah, um, and yeah, I discovered those, and I was like, wow, we're, what? Uh, and those are new programs too, by the way. It's sales is that's how that's kind of how sales is. Most people come into sales from some other place, hmm. and then um, find success. And, and once you once you develop a sort of a taste for it, once you have a good plan and you find that you're successful, um, it's kind of hard to walk away. So <laughs> that's why I'm still here. I love sales. You know, I was I was a musician, a vocalist in, in high school, college, and then I I was going to go to law school, and then I worked in the eyeglass industry and all these things. And then, man, you, you get to achieve so many fantastic things by connecting with people and, uh, through sales conversations. And then, I mean, it's kind of hard. It's kind of addicting. I just, I love it. So. Yeah. Yeah. It it is a great profession to be in. The last question I have is, is kind of having to do with people's perception of salespeople and I bring this up because a lot of the customers that um, when I was an ed rep and in the ed reps listening, their customers are teachers. They work in a very, not necessarily a business kind of environment. And I'll, I'll be straight up with you. A lot of teachers, when you say the word sales professional, they get very, uh, almost, they put up a wall. <laughs> they get defensive. They don't want anything to do with being sold to or having a salesperson in their classroom. They want nothing to do with it. Do you have any thoughts on, as a sales professional, how to perhaps break down that wall, that barrier that some people have, uh, this negative connotation of, of salespeople? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I, and, you know, I think it's really sad. It was a sad state of affairs that when people consider sales a salesperson, um, that for a lot of people, they have a, maybe a negative taste in their mouth about salespeople generally. And there are individuals in the sales industry that have contributed to that, which is a shame. Sure. Um, but they're like just far and away not representative of, of the vast majority of salespeople. But the problem is I might know that and you might know that. But how do we how do our how we can we get our customers to know that? Um, and so. I think it goes, to, it basically goes, if you look back at the nine acts of the sale, acts two, three, and four are where we sell ourselves. The fact of the matter is they may not like sales people, but they might like you personally. Uh, right. Right. So um, it goes, it goes to this. I'll just speak to this. Um, if you, if you poll uh, people generally and they say, you know, what is your thought or approval on, you know, Congress? If you look at Congress and politicians, and I, I don't want to bring up politics, you know, specifically, but if you poll people about their approval ratings of like Congress generally, they hate them, right? Congress is horrible. They do nothing. Nobody likes Congress. You know, um, okay, great. But okay, well, what do you think about your congressperson? This, oh, no, oh, I love her. She's fantastic. No, it's all, it's, it's all those other, they're horrible. But so I don't love Congress, but I love my congressperson. You know, I don't love yeah. Senate, the Senate, but I love my senator, you know? Um, right. And so I'm, you know, I'm sure there are some people who don't like their senator too, but that's what you find is that if you look at, the body in aggregate, the approval rating is very low. But if you look at the individual's approval ratings, they are enormously higher. Interesting. Um, and yeah, and I think they have the same, it's the same thing at play for sales. 
which is to say that, you know, gosh, maybe I don't like salespeople in aggregate because they've had a poor experience or they just have a negative impression or TV and culture creates this, you know, a impression of salespeople. Mm -hmm. But, but gosh, when I went to that jewelry store, I had a great, that, that one lady helped me. She was fantastic. When I, you know, when I needed to buy that new piano or when I needed to, to buy instruments for my classroom, actually um, that individual who helped me, man, he was really great. And I just love that guy, you know? So that's, that's the difference is if, if we can follow the, the, the help people when they're making purchases to follow the five buying decisions in order. In other words, if we sell ourselves first, that's how you overcome the stigma of the, you know, sale pushy salesperson. Just demonstrate that you're not right mm -hmm. up front. Mm -hmm. And so, and part of that is most, and this is a mistake, a legitimate mistake that many salespeople make is that they think, okay, I've got 30 seconds in front of this teacher. I've got 30 seconds in front of this administrator. I need to like get my elevator pitch ready. I got to like wow them with what my product can do. Uh, that's, I think, exactly the wrong approach. Um, I'm sure people are welcome to argue with me about that. But I think if you've only got a few seconds, you need to sell you immediately with a smile, with a question about, you know, the, you know, what you see or asking them about themselves in that if in that first 30 seconds, they talk, and you don't, you will win, you're more likely to win if in that very first like few minutes, they do all the talking or most of the talking then you win. And that's where you begin selling yourself. And that's the exact opposite of what they expect. Because what they expect is for you to barge in the door and immediately throw open your pamphlet or your brochure or your whatever and be like, here's what we can do and here's how great we are and here's what's so amazing. And that's exactly what they expect. And that's what they don't want. But if you meet somebody for the first time or introduce yourself and the very first thing you do is start showing genuine interest in them, that's how the walls come down. Because guess what? Um, guess what their favorite subject is? It, it's, it's not you. It's not your product. It's their favorite subject is themselves and their concerns and their frustrations. So if in the if at front you show interest, genuine interest in them, and ask them really fantastic, insightful questions that that mean that they talk almost entirely and you don't, you just listen. That's where the walls come down. And now they might still hate salespeople, but they don't hate you. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, that is such great advice, CJ. I, it is so true. And I think we can all look back at uh, just our, our general life, working with salespeople in buying anything from cars to uh, stereos to soccer balls. We can all look back and, and think of those people who thought, oh, yeah, that person was in a sales role. But man, I really like that person. That They really made me feel great about myself. And so I, I bought their services or, or their products. I think we can all think about those other people too. Like, oh my gosh, I went in, I went to buy this thing and they were so terrible. I walked right out. <laughs> right, right. Well, and the great thing is for your audience is that, you know, especially if you're dealing with schools and I mean, you're not necessarily, it doesn't hurt you to share a great resource with your colleagues, right? Because I'm not, I'm not really competing with the other, you know, school. I'm not competing with those other music teachers. So if I had a great experience, then I'm, you, your, your folks might be, your clients must, might be more likely to refer the salesperson to their colleagues mm -hmm. because it doesn't hurt them to do so. There's some industries where it's like, okay, I had this, I had this great, I have this great resource. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like, you know, hoard it for myself. But in you guys' instance, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think no, that you no, know, if they have a great experience with you, they're much more likely to hear their colleagues complaining and say, oh, you know, you should call my guy. You should call my lady. She'll be great. You know, and so you're much more likely to get fantastic referrals because. Yeah, yeah, great point. Great point. Well, I really appreciated uh, this conversation today, and um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a fan of the action selling uh, company in the process and, and the book. And I should probably say I am in no way compensated by action selling today. This is, <laughs> this is all genuine. I really, I really uh, think this is such a, a, a great tool for any sales professional to, to use. And I highly recommend uh, do at least go get the book. It's an easy read. It really opens your mind to, to the fact that selling is a skill. And, and if you, those listening take nothing else away. I think the whole reason I wanted to have CJ on today is not just to share how, how great action selling really is, but just the fact that selling is a skill. 
just like playing a musical instrument. You know, you, you can't listen to uh, just a podcast or watch a YouTube video about how to play the trumpet and be an expert at the trumpet right away. It takes time and practice, and it is really a skill that requires teachers and mentors and master classes. You know, think about all the things that you did as a musician to get to where you are as a player today. Sales is the same way, I find. It's just, it's another skill that is not something you can learn by watching a YouTube video or listening to a podcast or, or reading a book. It's something that, it's a lifetime process. And I hope you take that away uh, today. And again, if you're if you're interested, go check out the, the program notes on this episode and you'll find links to Action Selling, to the book, um, to more information. And uh, again, CJ, I, I can't thank you enough. No, this is my pleasure. I genuinely love talking about this. So any excuse, <laughs> any excuse I get to talk about this kind of stuff, I absolutely love it. Um, this has been a joy. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and share. Um, and yeah, call me anytime. I'd love this. That's awesome. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. We hope you found the information in this episode useful and something you can use in your everyday life as an ed rep. If there is a topic you'd like to learn more about and have presented on a future episode of EdRep Radio, or you'd like to give us some feedback in general, please email us at edrepradio at eastmanstrings.com. To learn more about Eastman Music Company, go to our website, eastmanmusiccompany.com, or give your Eastman rep a call. Thanks, and drive safe.